Yeah, I'm Dimitri. I work in data engineering for different projects, mostly focusing on the modern data stack, either Snowflake and Databricks. Have experience with AWS, Azure, and GCP, and usually do very similar work, either build infrastructure for the data engineering and analytics, and in particular working on data platform and data integration, data ingestions, and sometimes a bit of BI to help end users either build the dashboard, so make sure they can access the data. I used to work five years in Amazon. We use only AWS. I used to work with AWS before. I used to work in after. So yeah, pretty good knowledge of AWS. I was data engineer for five years and I work in three different teams. It's Redshift, Elastic Map Reduce, Spark, Glue, Tableau, SBI, QuickSight. In terms of like networking to configure general VPC subnets, permissions, IAM roles, maybe some other services. Depends on the project, but the yeah, majority is those like data services that I mentioned. I think as well. In Microsoft, I implemented Azure Databricks based from scratch. I'm sure you have built a lot of data pipelines. How do you approach data validation during the ETL process? In terms of data validation, I think for me, like the best practices and like just idea can, what can give it to me is, for example, DBT. It's not really friendly with. Uh, Databricks, it, it supports Databricks, but I am I prefer not use DBT with um, Databricks. DBT, for every transformation you have, you can write the tests. And for every test, you can define it like at least uniqueness tests, uh, duplication, or like not null tests, accepted values, maybe the number in the range. And then you have the freshness test. So those basic test coverage help a lot. At least you make sure the data is fresh and accurate enough to present to the users. And then there are like opportunity to write any custom custom queries, uh, maybe a reference integrity, maybe calculate something uh, different. There are also plugins to using, for example, great expectations. I used to work uh, with Monte Carlo service. They also give idea what kind of tests uh, coverage exists and yeah, nice service because it's also it's automatically tracking uh, how tables change over time, how many rows you insert. And if one day you insert like too many rows, you get alert. It tracks uh, how many rows deleted. It tracks uh, uh, the schema changes. Anything awkward, if, for example, recently I had the case, our floor pipeline was succeeded, and I didn't notice that there was some uh, silent L error in DBT, but, Basically, Monte Carlo sent me alert. There is one table, and for the last 20 hours, the data wasn't updated. Then I look, yeah, our flow succeeded, but it actually didn't do what it should to do. In Databricks, uh, it's more either than I use Databricks or Glue. It's kind of test-driven development. Then for every function transformations, you can have the function that go on a test. It helps, especially in the team. With a proper CI process, it helps to avoid any issues. Like someone changed existing code, it should return the same result. That's why it's good to have like PyTest and assertions, even just on the dummy data set that it's always succeeded. And then uh, I know there is library like DQ for Spark. We used in Amazon, it can have some tests because Databricks supports the Python, so you're very flexible what you can do you can and test you can run before pipeline started just to check that the data you're going to load is make sense you can do after the if you load data you can in partition or process the data for the day you can check that number of rows you process makes sense you can compare it against like another day or average number of days and uh, the particular i uh, think for data quality is uh, how you can align the data in the schema not changing over the time, especially when you work with partners, either consume data or write data to them. Uh, for example, consume data from somehow, make sure that they not change something, how you can involve in this process, how they can notify you about changes, I don't know, data type, adding column, rename the column, because usually for those data lakes with table structure, it's very schema on write, so it basically the schema is important. And the same, if you do something, you write to the partner, any kind of structure, if you decide to change the structure, you need to let them know. And then, yeah, the question, how to do backfill in case of changes. How do you usually handle schema evolution? 
in terms of schema evolution, it works nice if, for example, I ingest uh, any files uh, in bronze layer, then I can just add the system to handle schema changes, just adding new columns. So it's, it's mostly like just adding columns in the end if there is new column. And this is the only use case I use it. And the primary reason was just to save time on the avoiding, like to create the branch pull request to do simple adding the column. If you're migrating or building by applying a new data set, how do you assure that what you have migrated has the same logic and returns the same data set? What do you mean returns the same result? If I run it twice, because I need to know against what I should validate. If I building pipeline, first of all, I want that if I accidentally run this pipeline twice, I want that the pipeline was idempotent. It means it basically avoiding any like duplication, just writing to itself one more time. That's why there are methods like, I don't know, delete and insert or absurd, just to make sure you, and then the test for duplication, just to avoid this. Then if you consume, depends where you consume the data. If you consume the data from API service or like relational database, you have the opportunity to validate end result, even just simply by, you know, number of unique customer IDs or number of rows against the source systems. If you're consuming data from telemetry base or just logs, you you probably don't have much evaluation against what, but you still can track the size of partition you load, maybe the volume of data you process, number of rows, some key metrics come up, I don't know, number of distinct events per hour number. But I don't have any actual result in the source systems because the source systems writing and probably lots of different writers exist, different like applications, devices, they all dump you data. So I can just, at least it's consistent. We have data pipelines and data volumes that change quite a lot. Can you tell me a challenge that you finished in batch pipeline where was a scaling issue? Then we have the scale problem. There are, for me, two primary reasons for this. One of them is just simple BI users, the clusters, and you connect your dashboard and your users running the dashboard. And if they don't know how to use it, they don't use any filters to limit the data they're going to scan. That's one issue. And here it's just how you can enforce that end users not breaking anything and you know, time out of sessions, workloads, policy, just uh, train the proper them, uh, build some pre templates of the workbooks or dashboards that they can use where you can explicitly specify, train them that there are tables might have partitions and it's important to utilize partitions. This is one case. Another case might be if you have ETL job that is running, and I had in, in the past with Athena, basically after almost a year of successfully running a daily pipeline in Athena, it's starting crashing with timeout. And it basically query logic that was it's multiple joins, including one cross joins for like some financial metrics in time series. Over the time, it's just blow up. Athena wasn't able to process this. So the solution was, because this logic was written by analysts, and first of all, trying to work with analysts, how you can avoid for example, because the clear, the cross join, they think is the big problem. It's starting like we're sending data everywhere between nodes that killing performance and because just volume of grow. And in Athena, you couldn't increase the cluster. You, you couldn't do anything. It's just the service. Um, the solution was to decouple the process. And the second is to the incremental load because for the year it was full reload. Incremental thing solved, solved the problem. We still had this cross join for time series. We still have the cross joins, but incremental things is solved. And it's overall pattern. Like if you build data lake from scratch, so long term, you should always think how you can at least minimum like uh, rows process or data process because it's very easy just oh let's do reload all data every day simple and fast but long term it's causing many problems either with the cost or performance but the quality of the data usually better than you fully reload data every day write a python function to return the intersection of two lists 
without using built-in set operations. So the function will get two lists as the input, and then so I can create the dictionary where I can store the values. Oh, no, not the dictionary, the list. There I can store the values. And then I will iterate. So yeah, it may be not that performant. We just need to go through the list. But the idea, yeah, the straightforward approach just to iterate over over the process. And if um, element available in list two and uh, list not in my list that I specified here, then then I can basically appending to, to available list. And this is and then I can return the intersection. What are testings and assertion for this function? Could you tell about use cases? So we have two lists as the input. So first we can uh, run the function and we can print result. Here we expected that they intersect on two and three. If I have this function, then I can create the assertion. And basically the idea here that I always want to have can just predefine them here and then doing this. And uh, so this and this function should return true if it passed. Also, I can use the assert, right? So here I expect in the function will return the true. But there is also, I think, another way just to use the same idea. So we can define many use cases, uh, usually. Uh, I don't like this case one and then for list one, list two and assertions. And if they all passed, I can just print uh, test passes. And this is what I used. Um, then I work with glue spark because we, um, I had uplocks telemetry and the idea was that I create the, basically the YAML representations of my logs. Then I converted them into normal table. And then my code, it creates uh, the data frame based on this. And then it's run assertion, but for the data frames. Based on my dummy data, I always expect the same result in assertion. And this helped if you do any pull request code change that you first locally run the assertion or like this PyTest. You should always, if you're adding the new metric, you need to modify the, the test cases and then using the same pattern and then run PyTest. The next step was adding this thing into CI process. The glue spark provide the Docker image uh, with glue spark. And you even can mimic like S3 endpoint using inside Docker. So it's kind of like service that basically your S3 path will be because we're using S3 in the code. So S3 path is actually having, returning you something. Image weight was over one gigabyte and the overall time building was quite a while of running the tests. So we never implemented this. Write a SQL query to create a running sum for sales person ID and sale date, and then create the ranking based on this metric. We want to calculate the running total for, for each salesperson and end date, right? Okay. okay, okay, first, assuming this works fine. This just return us. Um, and next thing we can use the window function. I've got exact the name, but running some. I group it by salesperson ID and sales date. And you, you assume that it will fail and tells me that amount not in grouping. This is the window function. And here I give the condition, what's my window? And my window is a salesperson ID, and then it's uh, shoot on the row label to do this thing. Maybe I, I need just do this. Ideally, I will run this query and previous query and just to see the output of the query console. Based on the running sum, assume this, um, query working fine and then first i will yeah i can do this trying first running put it here ranking function but 
yeah, I better will split it for now. Uh, I will, and now I can use the the rank function. I might add this. Might probably not adding this. Um, oh no, I need because I have the data. Okay, partition by. I also can use dense rank. I think here in case if the number have the same value. So I try to understand first um, uh, the, the partner, as far as I understood the role related to one of your partners where you provide the data sets. Is this true? It's just like single partners. Currently you already provided those data sets based on the Athena and you want to build the same in Databricks or in this case, I like Snowflake, then you can have this. I think in Databricks, there is also data sharing capability. So if we just, it gives you ability not to moving data physically. So just create the data share. And if they have Databricks account, they can just come you consume it as external data source. That makes sense. And uh, in terms of changing of requirements, how frequently like requirements, okay, you build pipeline, you start delivering this, how frequently it changes. I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Bye.